I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back once again, all CHP listeners, new and old. Laszlo Montgomery here, bringing you part 11 in this History of Taiwan series. My thanks, as always, for listening. Well, we got as far as the first Taiwan Strait crisis and the May 24th incident. I also touched on Christianity in Taiwan. Wasn't sure where to stick that, but you heard about that last time. I just wanted to follow up on the first Taiwan Strait crisis and the aftermath and then look at the lead up to the second one and take things up to eh, about 1962. Then midway through this episode, we're going to change trains, if you don't mind, and I'm going to say a little bit about the KMT repression endured by the Taiwanese people during the period of martial law. In this period, from the declaration of martial law by Chun Chung in May 1949 until it ended in July 1987, had all the hallmarks of today's most famous autocratic one-party states or monarchies. So we'll take a look at the white terror on Taiwan during that 38-year period. So many white terrors in history, as I mentioned once before. So last time we saw, despite the 1954 Mutual Defense Treaty and the subsequent Formosa Resolution, all was not so lovey-dovey between the Americans and their ROC allies. There was plenty of animosity and suspicion that ran in both directions. But they had signed that treaty, and they both had to live by it. Thanks to this relationship, the CIA was getting access to a lot of useful intelligence. Jiang had presented a very forceful argument to Eisenhower and Dulles about the importance of Jingmen and Mazu to the overall mission of going back and retaking the mainland one day. And to walk away from these two places was to capitulate to Mao and the communists, retreating from Jingmen and Mazu and allowing Mao to take them. Well, that, that meant the fight was over. And what was the use to continue trying to restore the Republic of China on the mainland? Everyone knew the significance of what this meant. Mao, too, he knew. For the PRC, Jinmen and Matsu were two props that Mao could occasionally use to stir things up between the U.S. and Jiang. The U.S. side, Eisenhower, Dulles, every representative who had access to Jiang, they all made it clear, knowing that these two offshore islands were such a flashpoint, it made the American side very nervous being on the hook for Taiwan's security in the event of you-know-what. They wanted Jiang to give serious thought to the idea of giving up on or demilitarizing Jinmen and Matsu. Following the cessation of hostilities into 1956 and 1957, Jiang kept beefing up his military presence on Jinmen. The alliance with the U.S. was offering all kinds of -of state-of-the-art weapons of war. And even though he couldn't stand his American allies, they still backed him. During this period in between the first and second Taiwan Strait crises, Jiang had placed his most highly trained and elite troops there. And these troops crowded onto Jinmen and Mazu were his first line of defense if invasion day came. In April of 1956, there were more than 100,000 soldiers on Jinmen and Mazu. And all the ROC's most powerful and deadly military hardware was kept there, too. By 1957, eight years after liberation on the mainland, Jiang had to be thinking, it's now or never. With Uncle Sam standing behind him and all this powerful military equipment at his disposal, he felt emboldened to front burner the mission to retake the mainland. Using their spies and networks of agent provocateurs, The ROC kept up paramilitary attacks on the Fujian coast and wherever else their reach existed, always probing, always hoping their actions would spark some uprising. That was a big thing. More than ever before, Jiang was pining for a kind of Dazixiang uprising of 209 BC that set events in motion that led to the fall of the Qin and the founding of the Han. 
Jiang was convinced by 1957 that Chinese people had had enough of the CCP, and if the nationalists returned, they'd be welcomed with open arms. At the same time, Jiang knew without that groundswell of popular support that would follow an uprising, it's doubtful events could be set in motion that would ultimately lead to his triumphant return. It had been since 1926 that Jiang had first started going after the communists. Now, 32 years later, after all that past history that happened in Guangzhou, in Shanghai, in Jiangxi, all the spying, the torture, and double-crossing, the Xi'an incident, Japanese invasion, the bitter defeat in the Civil War, after everything that had been thrown at him. Chiang Kai-shek wasn't given up just yet. Even if a 1950s version of the Datsuxiang uprising happened in spades, and there was a nationwide rising up of the masses, Chiang knew if he was going to ride that wave of popular anti-communist discontent on the mainland, he was going to need the U.S. military all in. And that was the problem. By 1958, Jiang had made enough statements and had sent out enough signals to make people very nervous at the Pentagon. The whole Jin Men and Matsu thing again. If something was going to happen militarily between the ROC and PRC, that's where it was going to start. Jiang had been vigorously insisting to Dulles and Eisenhower they had to come to the rescue if push came to shove you know, with regard to the resupplying of those two island fortresses on Jin Men and Matsu. So into the summer of 1958, with Jiang having an itchy trigger finger and the U.S. government telling him don't launch an attack on the mainland without their permission, the second Taiwan Strait crisis began. Keep in mind, this happened three years before the Cuban Missile Crisis. So these were peak Cold War years, which made the events I'm about to describe that much more dangerous. We look at last August 2022 like it was such a big deal. Compare that to this. In 1957, 1958, Mao was feeling invincible, and with all the revolutionary winds blowing in his sails and all the recent achievements in the communist world, what better time was there to take things in China to the next level? So he went and launched the Great Leap Forward. In 1958, on the eve of the Second Taiwan Strait Crisis, the disastrous part of the Great Leap hadn't happened yet. From July 31st to August 3rd, 1958, Khrushchev was in Beijing meeting with Mao. And among the topics discussed was the idea of cooling things off in the Taiwan Strait before things spun out of control. After all of Mao's recent speeches about liberating Taiwan and the perceived threats emanating out of Beijing, what Khrushchev was advising wasn't what Mao wanted to hear. This visit by the Soviet leader was the famous meeting where Mao forced Khrushchev to go swimming with him in the Zhongnanhai pool. This Soviet leader was a man more comfortable in a mine shaft than he was in a swimming pool and famously got schooled by the chairman. Despite Khrushchev's entreaties not to, Mao took the opportunity to turn things up a notch in the Taiwan Strait. The calls to liberate Taiwan became more and more bellicose. And Mao was banking on the Americans, doing a lot of yelling, but not backing up their threats if real hostilities erupted. Then on August 7th, ROC and PRC jets clashed over Qinmen, and this was followed by the shooting down of two F-84s on routine patrol. PLA jets were placed on offshore islands, gassed up and ready to go. And anyone familiar with this situation might be right in thinking Mao was up to something. Mao Zedong, he picked the perfect time to stand up and start pounding the table. In July of 1958, American Marines had stormed ashore in Lebanon to intervene in a civil war involving the U.S.-backed leader, Camille Shamon. This was the time of Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt and the creation of the United Arab Republic. Heady days in the Arab world at that particular moment, And Mao knew the U.S. would have its hands full dealing with that Lebanon crisis while he stressed them out in the Taiwan Strait. On the evening of August 24th, 1958, the PLA attempted an amphibious landing on this island south of Jinmen that was occupied by the ROC. 
go look on Google Earth for Dongding Island. It's so tiny and isolated. Dongding is, is barely even an islet. Anyway, the PLA tried to storm the island, but were repulsed by the ROC garrison there, and the whole thing was called off, and Dongding remained in nationalist hands. Then the PLA started firing off the first of tens of thousands of artillery rounds on Jinmen. Jinmen, in terms of land area, is about the size of Oakland, California. So if you could imagine 20,000 rounds all fired in the direction of that place, you could get an idea about the ferocity of this barrage and how concentrated it was. The volume of the shelling going on and the intelligence being analyzed led the American side to believe Ma was serious this time about taking back those two island groups and eliminating Jiang. End August and into September, the PLA kept blasting away, but was always careful not to fire in the direction of any resupply vessels sailing with U.S. Navy cover. Jiang had once again found a way to convince the U.S. to provide this military assistance. At the time of this second Taiwan Strait crisis, new kinds of U.S. advanced weapons were making their way to Taiwan. Eisenhower had already sent the U.S. 7th Fleet to the Strait, and was such a considerable U.S. presence now in the area, and after feeling satisfied, he made his point. By September 11th, Mao had toned down the velocity of the shelling. The focus on the Second Taiwan Strait crisis now shifted to the skies, where ROC F-86s were engaging with PLA MiG-17s. Among the advanced weapons that were rolling off the assembly line of America's new permanent arms industry, that Eisenhower would later warn us all about, was a new and revolutionary air intercept missile called the AIM-9 Sidewinder. It had first entered service in 1956, but it was during this second Taiwan Strait crisis that these infrared homing air-to-air missiles were first used in combat. The ROC F-86s were modified so that they could carry these Sidewinder missiles, and the MiGs that were shot down in combat were the first military aircraft to succumb to -to air-to-air missiles in battle. The ROC Air Force took down 25 MiGs with these new missiles. Good for the Soviets and bad for the Americans. Well, one of those state-of-the-art AIM-9 missiles fired by an ROC pilot hit a MiG-17 and didn't explode, allowing the pilot to bring his fighter safely back to his base along with the unexploded AIM-9 Sidewinder. The missile was carefully removed from the MiG aircraft and promptly reverse-engineered into the deadly Soviet K-13 that entered service in 1961. The Sino-U.S. talks that had followed the Geneva Conference had already broken down in early 1958, and with this sudden escalation in hostilities, there weren't any decent official or unofficial channels for U.S. and PRC fixers and diplomats to work things out. Eisenhower was aggressively trying to not let this crisis get out of hand. Khrushchev had even warned Ike that an attack on the PRC was the same as an attack on the Soviet Union, and all that that meant. Finally, Zhou Enlai, always the pragmatist, suggested the talks that had come to naught in Geneva be resurrected at the ambassadorial level and to hold them in Warsaw. And this reopened channels of communication during this heated Second Taiwan Strait crisis. And incidentally, it was these Warsaw talks that carried on into the 1960s that ultimately led to Nixon's visit in 1972. Much to Jiang's chagrin, the U.S. was trying to get both sides to agree to a ceasefire. He was still making a lot of noise about escalating the conflict and retaliating against the mainland trying to get the conflict to reach a tipping point that would force the hand of the Americans. Ma was sitting back and waiting to see how far the U.S. was willing to go. All throughout this period of shelling and jet fighters engaging in combat over the Taiwan Strait, American officials let it be known that if the PRC crossed certain red lines, the U.S. would leave the nuclear option open. You know, many of us today look at President Putin with disdain for daring to threaten Ukraine with these most horrible of all weapons. 
Well, back in September and October 1958, threats from American military and State Department people about using nukes and a limited engagement were being mentioned a little too casually and often. America's French allies were livid at such talk being bandied about. No one could say how close we actually got to a nuclear war during the second Taiwan Strait crisis, but it always sends a chill up and down one's spine when their use gets mentioned, especially when it comes from a nuclear power. The worst of the crisis was over by the end of September. Under intense U.S. pressure on September 29th, 1958, Jiang held a press conference and stated that Jinmen and Mazu were being defended because of their importance to Taiwan as a shield to protect them against an attack from the PLA. And he made it clear that the importance of these two islands to the ROC was for defensive purposes only, not as a springboard from which to launch an attempted attack on the mainland. And as far as U.S. involvement, Jiang said, quote, We shall not ask our ally to participate with ground forces. This is a guarantee I can responsibly and openly offer to the world at large. End quote. So, end September and into October 1958, with all these signals being given and with Mao feeling satisfied, on October 6, 1958, a unilateral ceasefire was declared. Mao did let loose with a fresh barrage of artillery shells in protest of the October 21 visit to Taipei of Secretary of State Dulles. Dulles stopped in Taiwan to once more twist Jiang's arm about taking some of his forces off those offshore islands in order to relieve tension in the strait. And a lot of pressure was put on Jiang to think of alternative ways to achieve his goals other than provoking the communists. After plenty of heated discussion... Jiang reluctantly agreed to sign a communique where he stated that he wouldn't use force and would only act defensively. Jiang understood the Americans to be saying, it's okay if you want to use force as long as you're not the one initiating hostilities. So depending on how you want to interpret that, it could mean more than one thing. On October 25th, 1958, 19 days after announcing a ceasefire, the Chinese Defense Ministry ordered troops from this day forward to only shell these offshore islands held by the ROC on odd-numbered days. And eventually, both sides came to an arrangement in which they would shell each other's garrisons on, on alternate days. This unconventional agreement continued on like a daily ritual for 20 years until the PRC and the United States normalized relations. And the amusing thing was the payloads inside these projectiles being fired at each other, they weren't loaded with explosives or incendiaries. They were filled with propaganda leaflets that excoriated each other's government. On December 2nd, 1958, the U.S. Navy started sailing away and everything returned to the new normal. As 1959 dawned, Chiang Kai-shek had to resign himself to the notion that the Americans backing him in any attempt to retake the mainland wasn't going to happen. If a chance had ever existed to go back and resume the Civil War, it had already happened and could only be looked back on as a missed opportunity. Too much time had passed and all the circumstances, despite the impending Sino-Soviet split and the blowback from the Great Leap Forward, now favored Jiang's hated rival. So everything quieted down in the Taiwan Strait. Mao let loose 100,000 artillery shells on Jinmen when Eisenhower made his July 1960 stop-off on his East Asian tour. Whenever the party wanted to show displeasure at anything, they would always resort to this act of blowing off bombs and letting these explosions in the Taiwan Strait speak for them. Jiang got boxed in and agreed to the official no-first-attack policy. And despite making assurances to Ike, Jiang later that year, in October 1960, was still publicly stating that the nationalists would retake the mainland in three to five years at most. The circumstances in 1960 may have appeared much more dire and hopeless for the nationalists, but the dream lived on. So, I think that's all I need to tell you about the first and second Taiwan Strait crises, as far as the hour-by-hour order of events that took place during the battle and all the names of all the vessels and the list of hardware used and what happened in the air and on the ground. 
All that stuff is out there for any military lovers, so I hope no one minds that I didn't mention these details. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big-name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. I don't think we're going to be able to get to this in part 11, but right around this point, 1959-1960, the government on Taiwan began to refocus their efforts on the economy rather than remain on an indefinite war footing, as if the PLA was going to invade any day. Here is where economic development for the first time supplanted national defense and military affairs as the top national priority. I hope no one has any objections to my backtracking a bit. I've mentioned the white terror already, but haven't really said anything about what it was and what it meant to live in Taiwan during those times. On a simple level, the Wai Sheng Ren, who had come to Taiwan from the mainland between 1945 and 1955, their politics and aspirations were mostly represented by the KMT, and their numbers constituted a small minority of the total population of Taiwan. In 1958, there were already 10 million people living on Taiwan, double what it had been 23 years earlier in 1935. This was due in part to the million or million and a half arrivals from the mainland. But the vast majority of the Taiwanese people, the Bansheng-ren, were local to the island going back generations. Some Taiwanese had been living there since before the Dongding Kingdom and Cheng Chenggong in the 17th century. And due to all the heavy-handedness of Chen Yi's management of the KMT takeover of Taiwan beginning in 1945, and of course the 228 incident of 1947, right at the outset, the native Taiwanese, including the indigenous people, acquired a very anti-KMT stance. For Jiang, his party, and his entire government— if the masses of Taiwanese people were not going to line up with him, and if they dared to openly or secretly talk about trying to share his power or influence his policies, they had to not only be stopped in their tracks, they had to be made examples of too. Again, I don't want to lead you to believe Chiang Kai-shek was special in any way. The tactics he employed were no different from any other dictator. Most people on Taiwan, in 1958 at least, had never been to China. And don't forget, prior to 1945, they were speaking only Japanese, Taiwanese, Hakka, indigenous languages, or a combination thereof, but no Mandarin. We saw throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s, the whole idea of taking back the mainland remained front and center as far as the KMT's national policy went. So in order to ensure no one got in the way of these plans or spied for the communists at such a critical moment in Taiwan's history, the White Terror was initiated. The U.S., despite all the hundreds of millions of dollars of aid flowing in the direction of Taiwan, where the White Terror was concerned, eh, sat on its hands and elected to do nothing about all the repression on Taiwan, Jiang, Now, he may have been a dictator in every sense of the word, but eh, he was our dictator. I myself have been fortunate to have never lived under martial law or in a one-party state led by a brutal dictator and can't speak from experience. Especially during the 1950s and 60s, familiar actions like cracking down on leftists and communists and anyone sympathetic to them became commonplace everyday occurrences. The white terror mainly focused on these two elements, but quickly grew to include basically anyone who openly criticized the government. In all the American propaganda that I recall from my early years growing up in the Midwest, we knew Taiwan as Free China, as opposed to the other one, Red China. Boy, what a dog whistle those two words were back then. Taiwan may have been called Free China, but the reality back then was anything but that. I think I mentioned... 
in 1980 during my first visit to Taiwan. I was taught very quickly not to openly speak about certain things and to be careful when mentioning terms like Mao, Da Lu, and other provocative words. In 1951, Green Island Prison was built. This place later became synonymous with KMT repression. It wasn't built for this purpose, but Green Island got turned into a penal colony for Taiwanese dissidents who disagreed with the ruling political party or who advocated for an opposing view. Green Island was like an Alcatraz kind of a place. It was 21 miles off the southeast coast of Taiwan, much more distant than Alcatraz. Most of us have seen enough movies or read enough books to have a fair idea about what kind of things that went on in these kinds of prisons where political dissidents were sent. Green Island was no different than any other, right down to the re-education and strict regimen of daily punishment and all manners of indignities that come with being incarcerated for your political beliefs. On Taiwan, with the minority controlling the majority, allowing for a robust democracy would have most likely led to a change in government. If the KMT got voted out, then what about the mission to recover the mainland? An opposition party representing the will of the Taiwanese Bansheng-ren majority would lead Taiwan into uncharted two Chinas and one China, one Taiwan territory. And so, to prevent any chance of this kind of thing happening, the KMT drew on all the skills, tools, and methods acquired and streamlined over a period of more than two decades of spying and repression on the mainland. And they put it all to work on Taiwan. The Taiwan Garrison Command ran everything. They were the heirs to all the methodologies and treachery of all the KMT spy masters going back to even before Dai Li's time. Past lessons learned and rooting out communists and political dissidents or potential political dissidents were put to use on Taiwan. There were public executions and all manners of harshness meted out that was meant to cow society and keep everyone in line. Surveillance was omnipresent, and they didn't have the technologies of the 2020s. It was much more visible and in your face. Later on, I'll mention a case of extrajudicial assassination that took place. Enemies of the KMT, if they were high profile enough, well, agents would be contracted or sent overseas to deal with them. The Taiwanese social elite, the intellectuals and professors, journalists, they were always under the most intense scrutiny. The KMT targeted these groups of people and imprisoned many of them preemptively, not even waiting for them to stir up the masses with their words or actions or openly refusing to call a deer a horse. The KMT didn't invent that idea. Even during the times of the Qin Dynasty, this strategy was employed. It's still around today. Let me just mention the White Terror didn't exclusively involve the Taiwanese. It also affected mainlanders as well. Communists and suspected communists who had migrated to Taiwan during the Great Retreat were also hunted down day and night, especially during the 1950s when everything that had just transpired in the Civil War was still so fresh. When we get to the 1970s, I'll introduce a number of high-profile Taiwan politicians and dissidents who served as the marquee names from the Taiwan democracy movement. That's all for next time, or the time after that. We'll see. As you recall, after 228, martial law had been ended, and there was an attempt made by the government on Taiwan to make nice and turn down the heat as far as the violence and daily repression against the local people went. But on May 19, 1949, with defeat on the mainland a certainty, Chen Cheng declared martial law again on Taiwan, and people had to bid a sad farewell to these civil and political liberties they got to enjoy for a couple of years. Throughout the white terror that went hand in hand with the 38-year period of martial law, there aren't any reliable, exact numbers about how many people were killed. Depending on who you ask, the numbers vary. There were thousands of people who were executed. The number of people who were imprisoned it numbered more than 100,000. 
How many of them endured torture or the terrors of enhanced interrogation? Eh, Can't say for sure. But all that stuff happened. Under martial law, they employed a new criminal code, which included a sedition law that got taken off the shelf quite often. It was comprised of a lot of legal jargon, but basically said anyone trying to overthrow the government or the state will be imprisoned from six months to five years. It was like the emergency law during the KMT's last white terror back on March 7, 1928, that gave the authorities carte blanche to severely punish anyone who spread doctrines that were incompatible with the KMT. And to ensure the next generation wouldn't get any ideas, the KMT strictly controlled education, including what was printed in the textbooks and taught in the classroom. Every consideration was given to educate the future minds of the children and young people of Taiwan. And their patriotic education it was a little more militaristic than what I might have grown up with, and in the 1950s at least was heavy on the take back the mainland part. But it was meant to inspire allegiance to the country, and in Taiwan's case, the KMT and Sun Yat-sen's Three People's Principles as well. The number of significant headline incidents from 1949 to the 1960s that involved arrests of high-profile dissidents, violence, imprisonment, and execution were almost annual in their occurrence. Because the policy of the KMT was to promote Mandarin as the guoyu, or national language, a kind of language police were employed to keep their eyes and ears open in society at large and inside the schools to police the use of Taiwanese. If you got caught speaking Hoklo or Hakka, you might be publicly shamed and or fined. You didn't get sent to Green Island or anything, but you were made to pay a price. And this was how the island was transforming to a predominantly Mandarin-speaking society. Inside the home and within certain communities, eh, they spoke whatever they wanted. Taiwanese theater, opera, and other spoken word traditions, those too suppressed for the time being. Along with the million and a half mainlanders who fled to Taiwan as a result of the outcome of the Civil War, came their values, education system, and all the subcultures of all the people from all the cities who ended up on Taiwan, including their regional cuisines and literature and unique regional flavors that became part of 1960s Taiwan. In fact, almost everything that could have been uprooted from their Chinese homes was replanted on Taiwan. And any one-party state worth its salt knows if you control the information people have access to, you can more easily control the attitudes of the people. Hundreds of radio shows, TV shows, newspapers, magazines, and journals became freely available on newsstands and bookshops. Everything was censored and had to comply with the narrative laid out by the government. And one more thing, the many mainlanders, starting from Chun Yi's time, had grown into a kind of resented new elite on the island. Their kids went to the better schools and had access to better education and career opportunities. And if their parents were well-placed inside the KMT, it was possible to open doors that other Taiwanese and poor mainlanders could only dream of knocking on. In 1960, in order to secure a third term and not have to worry about what the Constitution said in Article 47, Jiang had the National Assembly amend the law of the land to add something that was called the Temporary Provision Against the Communist Rebellion. This temporary provision opened the door for a third term as president. Now, in no way am I saying President Xi got this idea from Jiang Kai-shek, but history repeats from time to time. And though I'm you know, jumping ahead, since I was mentioning how Jiang wasn't willing to let go of the president's office in 1960, well, he went for a fourth and fifth term in 1966 and aged 85 in 1972. And it was midway through his fifth term in 1975 that he passed away, one year before Chairman Mao and Premier Zhou. The White Terror it pretty much lasted as long as Jiang Kai-shek lasted. And when we get to his physical demise in the 1970s, you'll see, beginning with his son and successor, Jiang Jingguo, a lot of changes start happening. 
into the 1960s, more countries were taking stock of the situation on both sides of the Taiwan Strait and were beginning to lean in the ever-hopeful to China's direction. There were also the first faint signals from other countries that indicated it was doubtful the ROC would hold on to that UN Security Council seat for much longer. No matter what hopes everyone had immediately following the communist victory in 1949, well, after so many years, it was fairly obvious the People's Republic of China was here to stay. By 1957, more than a third of the countries in the world had already established diplomatic relations with the PRC. In 1960, JFK was elected, just barely, but no changes to Taiwan policy were made just yet. Jiang in his speeches, despite all the agreements with the Americans, was still openly calling for taking back the mainland, even hinting that they do it without the U.S. if necessary. May 1961... Lyndon Johnson, VP at the time, went to Taipei for talks and wanted to hear it direct from Jiang himself that he was still on board with what he agreed to with Dulles in that October 23, 1958 communique. They still wanted to be reassured by Jiang that a non-military course would be sought to take back the mainland. No other options were available. But despite what Jiang was agreeing to, there were still too many signals coming from Taipei that indicated something was brewing. In 1961, the feeling among many old stalwarts in Taiwan was that, well, now it had been 12 years already and time was a-wasting. And once again, the sentiment was, if they were going to take back the mainland, they better act now or never. As the 1960s got underway, there was a great amount of anxiety that World events seemed to be pushing the U.S. and other nations away from Taiwan. Behind all these speeches and pronouncements and the troop maneuvers was Jiang's final, last-ditch effort to achieve his main mission since 1949. And this was known as Project Guoguang, or National Glory. In Jiang's 1961 Double Ten Address, he played up the disastrous situation in China caused by the Great Leap Forward, and that now, in the wake of such suffering and popular discontent, was the best time to take the necessary steps to achieve their national goal. Jiang had even gone so far as to say, quote, Peace in Asia would come only with the overthrow of the Beiping regime, end quote. It had taken Chen Sheng and Wu Guang 12 years to rise up and start the revolt that brought down the Qin. Now it was also 12 years that the CCP had ruled the mainland, and tens of millions of people were dying from hunger. Many hopes were pinned on a comparable uprising happening on China. Early 1962, Jiang stepped up his talk of Project National Glory and retaking the mainland. You know, both sides, the PRC and ROC, had always been blasting their respective propaganda across each other's borders, by radio, and even by balloons that dropped leaflets over their respective territories. And in his New Year's message of that year to the masses in the PRC, Jiang had assured them that, quote, the armed forces have made adequate preparations for the counteroffensive and therefore are capable of moving into action at any time. End quote. So, early 1962, anyone in D.C. who was wise to the situation in the Taiwan Strait began to feel a little perspiration from all the talk coming out of not only Jiang, but from all his KMT stalwarts. If he pulled the trigger, the likelihood of creating a fait accompli that dragged the U.S. military into a new global conflict it was a definite maybe. And into 1962, preparations for Operation National Glory appeared to be in full swing. Where the mainland was concerned, once again, Jiang and everyone knew there was no way, given his troop strength, that the nationalists were going to be able to succeed in taking back the mainland and expelling the Communist Party leadership. Without the U.S. military backing him in this fight, the nationalists didn't stand a chance. And even with U.S. military support, well, that was no 100% guarantee of success. June 1962, the talk and all the military preparations reached a crescendo 
Mao hadn't taken Chiang's bravado lightly, and offshore islands were fortified yet again. And the PLA, starting to bounce back from the Great Leap Forward, made preparations for an invasion. To calm any fears in Beijing, on June 26, 1962, a U.S. diplomat let the PRC ambassador in Poland know there was no way the U.S. was on board with any of Jiang's talk about invading the mainland. And they essentially said, don't listen to that guy. For the final time, unable to enlist U.S. support for his invasion plans, come July of 1962, Jiang had to admit he tried everything he could, using the entirety of his powerful force of will that had served him so well going back to 1927. But in the end, he failed to get the U.S. to join him on this quest. Since the conclusion of the second Taiwan Strait crisis, the U.S. had more and more backed away from any previously held notions about the nationalists ever possibly going back and retaking the mainland and picking up where they left off in 1945. Jiang's requests for nuclear weapons were also denied. Jiang would have to abide by what had already been agreed in the 1954 Mutual Defense Treaty and Formosa Resolution. So starting right around 1962-1963, on the eve of Beatlemania, Jiang and everyone else who had shared the same dream had to privately admit, barring a miracle from heaven, they were never going to be able to retake the mainland and turn the clock back to 1945. And now, because of circumstances and the way things had played out since 1949, Jiang and his whole KMT government was painted into a corner with very few options as far as their long-term prospects went. Military assistance and supplying the ROC with sophisticated weapons eh, had limitations. The Americans offered only as much as they believed was necessary for the defense of Taiwan. Now, I'm leaving out all of the sidebars and rabbit holes involving American CIA and Taiwan military cooperation. The CIA station in Taiwan was never left with having nothing to do. 1961 also saw the Sino-Soviet split. It's pretty well known all across American intelligence agencies. No one saw this coming. So with this unexpected geopolitical bombshell of an event, the Americans began to ponder how to exploit such a new and game-changing situation. And as I said, this whole matter became a new obsession in the U.S., one that led directly to February 1972. Into the 1960s, Sino-American secret talks being held in Warsaw were going nowhere with respect to the matter of Taiwan. From where the nationalist government sat, the future was looking bleak. From 1945 to 49, they fought a civil war and lost to the communists. From 1949 to 1958, they remained on wartime footing, all along trying to escalate tensions by getting the American military to buy into the nationalist China vision. And I told you, in 1966, Jiang ran unopposed for a fourth term as president of the ROC. As far as how to handle Taiwan's future reunification plans... Well, that conundrum would have to await resolution at another date, as yet undetermined. Jiang knew his best course of action was to build up the Taiwan economy and begin the island's transformation into what it ultimately became in the 1970s and 1980s. And that's all for next time. In this episode, I mentioned all about the White Terror and how this provided a backdrop for a lot of what was happening on Taiwan during these Chiang Kai-shek years. Next episode, I will also start to introduce several figures from the history of those times, and through their experiences in seeking democratic reforms, we'll begin to understand what the opposition was calling for. All of this starts to look more relevant as far as today's Taiwan is concerned. So much more to go yet. This Taiwan History series will certainly run longer than that 12-part series on Xinjiang history. Still have the rise of opposition parties, the whole Taiwan economic miracle, the two rough years of 1972 and 1979, the death of the Generalissimo, Jiang Jingguo, Li Denghui, Chan Shui-bian, and plenty of incidents and historical characters and 
Dung Lee Jun, of course. We'll get to all that in due course and maybe another patented CHP rush to the finish. And then we'll put this one to bed and move on to the next great thing. If you made it this far, eh, you might as well stay to the end. So many topic suggestions I've received these past months. Thanks to everyone for keeping them coming. I'm set for the next 65 years. Okay, no promos or solicitations for money this time. Just my sincerest thanks for listening. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the state of California in fantastic L.A., wishing you all the best and cordially inviting all of you to come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.